the. You have to understand, I get this damn air conditioning right in the back of me. Oh, oh, yeah. Just give me the thumbs up when everything is ready. Great, thank you. And so everybody else will just melt. So, uh, sorry about that. You'll have to take off your clothes for this session. Len is with us after a trip from Russia, so he's a bit jet lagged. So we haven't had a chance to really prepare this speech at all. We've been uh, going back and forth on emails and, and knowing that it would all suss out in the end. So am I cutting out? Am I good? All right. OK, good. Um, whoa, OK. Uh, so anyhow, I have a, uh, I want to thank you all for showing up to the talk. It's uh, really important what we're going to talk about today. And I think that everyone needs to know what's going on, and I'm glad you're here. I, it's so hard for me to think about technologists in the outside world. Most of my friends are technologists. And I was at the grocery store not too long ago, and I have a bumper sticker on my car that says, coding is not a crime. And think of the way that is spelled, OK? Visualize it on my bumper. And this woman went by my car, and she looked at the bumper sticker, and she said, what are they doing to those damn fish now? So I mean, that, <laughs> that might kick in a little bit later. But uh, that goes to show you, I mean, the world is not in sync with what you are doing. Um, I had uh, <laughs> DEF CON marked down on my calendar, and this woman saw it, and she goes, is that the end of the world? Is that what, what's going to happen on August 1st? It, people don't know and understand and appreciate what it is that you guys do. And ignorance is the one thing that's going to be key in taking away the civil rights and, and rights in general of technologists and the rights to create and use technology. And the one thing that you can do is, is uh, do whatever you can to make that more, get more visibility on the issue. Uh, we had Pat Leahy passing the DMCA along with uh, um, AOL Time Warner and Disney. Um, he apologizes for it now, but it's a bit too late when you say So he said he did, had no idea what he was doing at the time. And now the damage is done. Um, so the best thing to do is to get some, get some uh, visibility around the issues. Um, let's see here. I've got all these cards here. Uh, Who are you? I am Sally Richards. Uh, I, um, I'm a technologist. I'm also a journalist. I've been writing and doing stuff in the technology field for the last 20 years. I write books about the future of technology. I consult to startups about where technology is heading. And uh, I'm very much wanting to preserve the civil rights, what few of them we have left. And that uh, infringes a lot on technology and the governance of technology. And uh, so right now, I'm going to introduce Len Kleinrock. Do you all know who Len is? Len is the co-founder of the internet. And before I hear any Al Gore jokes, uh, I'd like to remind you that Al Gore introduced the DMCA. So his name should not even be mentioned in the same breath as Len Kleinrock. Uh, Len and, and Larry Roberts, the other co-founder of the internet, um, made it possible to make something that you could hack into. So. Uh, Len is going to be talking today about what his original vision of the internet was and how things have progressed and how, how it's failed in, in his, his original uh, idea about the internet. Um, so Len is one of the most brilliant people I know and 
he is a great, wonderful speaker, which he, he will be much more elegant than I, who is, I'm very much a non-linear thinker and speaker and things. So he's going to be a hard act to follow, but um, let's give it up for Len. Yeah. Thanks very much, Sally. I'm, I'm afraid all the, the energy and charisma you're talking about is going to be filtered through this technology we call teleconferencing. But I, I'm happy to chat with this group. Uh, as you said, I'd like to say a few words of what the original vision of the Internet was that I had. And as you probably know, uh, in September 69, the Internet began at UCLA in my lab. Two months before that, a press release came out in which I articulated a vision as to what the internet would become. That vision had five components. First, the internet would where? It would be always on, always accessible. Anybody with any device could get on from any location at any time, and it would be invisible. Now, it turns out the internet succeeded in the first three of those goals but it failed in the last two. As all of you know, it's not easy to get on from any location at any time with a device by anybody. And certainly the internet is anything but invisible. If you consider booting up Windows or dealing with some of the arcane interfaces we have, the world certainly is not invisible. The question is, why did the internet fail in those last two pieces of the vision? And the answer has to do with the fact that it was a death-bound mentality in the late 60s and early 70s that produced things like TCP IP, where your IP address, your device, your phys physical location, and you were all locked together. We're no longer death-bound. We're nomads. We travel everywhere. The devices we carry change. Our IP addresses change. We're no longer behind proxies or behind firewalls. We reach out into the world, and it's a very flexible environment. And TCP IP has a hard time with that, as you know. So the question is, what do we do about that? And what did the original intent of the Internet have to do with the topic of today's session? Well, the Internet, as it was created, was one of the culture of openness, of sharing, of non proprietary access, and ownership. And it was funded and managed by an enlightened agency, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, where they allowed people to do what the on those things which were of interest to them. Not a lot of management control, oversight, project meetings, reports, etc. And when NSF stepped into the picture in the 80s, they in fact continued to promote that same culture. They had a very, very enlightened, acceptable use policy, which allowed all scientists in, and the dot-coms began to arise in the late 80s and early 90s, as you know. As soon as the dot-coms came in, we began to see things like spam, like tracking, like uh, pop-ups, like a certain invasion of our privacy. Things we didn't want were suddenly appearing. And then as a group such as I'm addressing here began to throw in hacking and spamming and viruses and worms and denial of service attacks, there was reaction. And the reaction was in the form of tracking, ID identification of who was using logging, etc. Now we've developed a technology, in fact, that has the ability to deeply invade our privacy, deeply invade it. And by accessing and using that technology, we in some sense are inadvertently opening ourselves to allowing the technology to invade the privacy. Every time you use your credit card, use your cell phone, log on to a machine, use your email pager, make a bank transaction, buy an airline ticket, in some sense, you're identifying who you are, where you are, what you're doing, and when you're doing it. And of course, the technology that you and I have created allow those things to be tracked. In fact, the trouble is that the challenge is how we balance the rights of government on the one hand to do the things they think they need to do with the rights as individuals that we were granted by our constitution. 
Technology has advanced faster now than the nation's norms and laws have for managing that advancement. And that's part of the problem we're facing, and that's part of the reaction we're seeing right now. In the past, when our government was encountered with a scare or a threat, they panicked, and they typically went up for Typically ended up not hitting their target, but in fact finding ways to invade and our rights in ways that we were not comfortable with. So our actions and usages are being tracked right now. They're being collected and used and so forth by groups that don't ask our permission. In fact, that we don't even know are using our information. Basically, our privacy is gone. Give it up, get over it, it's gone. And of course, that's a discussion today. I think the only way you're going to preserve your privacy right now and I'm saying this with tongue in cheek, is to strip down naked, go to the edge of the ocean, dive in, and hope there's no sonar tracking you, as there probably will be. The real answer to the question is, and the right way to deal with these issues, is to find a way to get our legislators, our executives, and our laws changed to match the ways in which we want to protect our privacy and our rights. At the moment, it's laissez-faire, it's not clear, technology is way ahead of our legal system, and the rights that are written into our code. That's the only introduction I wanted to make. Okay. Thank you. So, we're going to answer some questions. Yep. There we go. Thank you, Len. Uh, we're going to answer a few questions before we go into my side of the talk. So, any questions out there? None? Here we go. Okay, is it, ne is it, what was this? Is it necessary, is it necessary for, us to give up our privacy to engage on for us to give up our privacy to engage on online activity, yeah? Well, the operational word there is necessary. Um, the fact is, because of the technology that exists, which does have the ability to track what you're doing, what's done with that is in some sense subject to laws, policies, and administrative procedures. But the fact is you are giving it up once you engage in this technology. Now is it legal? Maybe not. Is it right? Maybe not. Is it done? For sure. Okay. Okay, um, gentleman is wondering if we should have two internets, one for commerce and one for just general public, if that would solve some of these issues. That sounds like a bad solution to me. Um, anytime you partition a network into more than one function, you lose the ability you know, the thing that makes the internet so great is the fact that you have hundreds of millions of people interacting and contributing their creative juices, things, that, things we can't anticipate ahead of time. And by partitioning the network, you may well preclude activities, creations, and interact ahead of time. And I think that would be a mistake. We lost the, the tail end of that, I think. Is there, is there a problem with the... Okay. Uh, Len, could you repeat the last part of that? I'm sorry. Yeah, what I said is I felt that partitioning the network into more than one type of network which don't interact strongly would be a mistake. I think we would end precluding innovations and creativity that we can't now anticipate. And any time you break a network into more than one piece, you're going to limit the interaction which is the heartbeat of the internet. Always has been and I believe will always continue. Oh, you got, a, you got another question? Okay. Okay, so by de facto, aren't we already uh, partitioning it currently because of all the legislation and all the firewalls and all of that? 
with typically in commercial organizations. If you want to install your own private private wall, that's your choice. But to insist that certain activities are firewalled against activities, again, would limit the kind of interaction I think the internet is so good at providing and which has been such, provided so many benefits to us in terms of new activities, new applications, new kinds of services. Okay. Um, any other questions? Right here. Do you advocate legislation that would limit, that would limit technology, technology? Or are you, or are you advocating legislation that will what? Hold individuals accountable for protecting information. Did you get that? I'm not sure I understand the difference there. The, the kind of legislation I'm talking about is the we as individuals and as a uh, population find offensive the kinds of things that is at, in discussion today. If we feel invaded, the right way to handle it is to change the law, is to maybe replace the particular groups representing us in government, and not to violate the law, and not to find ways to uh, get a Of course, you can choose to do that, and then you're asking to accept the consequences as well. Okay, thank you. Yep, back there. And is there a, a, a cordless mic that we can give people? Okay, talk loud. What do you think? Okay. Okay, what was that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No. What do you think the impact of the recently passed law creating the federal do not call registry is in terms of protecting consumer rights? Uh, could that be broadened to an anti-spam, uh, you know, all media, not just telephone calls type of approach? Did you hear that, Lynn? I think I heard that question. The, the do you want to generalize the do not call laws, which operate in the telephone system, to spam and other forms of internet um, unwanted delivery? Is that the question I hear? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My, my that mind? sounded like a yes. Okay. I, I believe that those kinds of laws are just fine. I mean, if you have a way to opt out of unwanted intrusions on your privacy, should be ways to voluntarily and sign up for that and have it enforced. I believe that's exactly the right way to do it. Trouble is, I think, is the effectiveness of those laws. Right now, the do not call laws, there's too many exemptions in the telephone system. Um, I suspect that would be true in any internet-based activity as well. But that means, excuse me, that's a question of fine-tuning the law. The basic concept, I believe, is correct. Okay, <laughs> the mics, I've got my other mic back. Um, uh, yeah, um, come, come up here and, sorry about this lens, it's a bit awkward. Sorry, everybody. I, I guess my question is, it was just, it seems like a general statement that we should pass laws or have legislation. Is there any particular person in the House or the Senate that's, kind of behind this right now, or is any group working on this, or how is this supposed to be deployed or implemented, or who's thought leaders on this? You get that? Yeah. I'm not familiar with who, with who in Congress is, is the right person to go to at this point. Um, I think first the expression of concern has to be made very clear 
and then find the particular supporting congressman or senator that will back that up. But I can't name identity, ident individuals right now. Okay. Yeah. So are there any groups that you know of, Len, that are working on this stuff? That Putting policies this together? This stuff. You mean being concerned about privacy? Yeah. Sally, you know them better than I do. The EFF yeah. certainly is one. Okay, yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of legislation currently being passed, surprisingly enough, by Democrats. Uh, Democrats aren't what they used to be. Um, there are some organizations, uh, you know, on the EFF.org site, there are links out there that you can go to. And, uh, uh, you know, legislation. It's more fighting for what we have right now than building on, on what we have because our legislation is uh, very fuzzy right now as far as that's concerned. I advise you to start your own group. Um, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Professor Kleinrock, I know that you served as an expert witness on behalf of a number of entertainment companies attacking several peer-to-peer -peer companies. I'm wondering if you're having any second thoughts in light of the subpoena campaign that has gotten underway that it seems to me is a pretty serious threat to privacy today. Well, my basic position is that stealing is wrong. And I feel that a lot of the exchanging of copyrighted material was not a proper action. And that's the base on which I decided to support continuing that kind of activity. The subpoenas that are taking place right now, um, it seems to be uh, a strong move. I, I think it's difficult to stop the music sharing. Um, and I think the record companies are having a hard time with that. I, I know they are. Um, so they're taking extreme measures. And in some sense, it could have been anticipated that would happen, uh, given the, the enormous amount of trading that's in place and the attitude by so many that this is not a yet. This is not business as usual. This is something that, you know, it's not out there for the taking just because it's available doesn't mean you should violate other people's rights in this activity. Okay. And any other questions out there? Yeah. Um, I'm curious as to your disinclination toward technological workarounds to government um, regulations and constraints. My example being what uh, Zimmerman gave us with developing PGP is something that essentially no government can take away from us. Now it was not illegal, but it was, let's say, an extra legal workaround. Um, similar things like anonymizers to permit anonymous net access seem to be ways to achieve privacy without having to persuade politicians to give it to us. Would you comment on those notions? Sure, I totally agree with what you say. I was talking about illegal activities. If there are workarounds, and there certainly are some of which you've mentioned, by all means go for it. It's at the edges of the legal system. Anything that can protect your privacy, by all means, makes sense. PG, for example. And I know Phil uh, paid a price for a period for having engaged in that activity, and yet the effect on the world has been significantly positive. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to go into my talk now. Is, is Phil in the audience? Phil Zimmerman here right now? No? Okay. Um, one of the things that all of us need to look back on is history when it comes to... I'm going to try and pin this back on. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? No? Yeah? No? No? I'm getting news back there still. Bah. Okay, how's that? Is that all right? 
Got it back there? All right. Um, one of the things we tend not to look at is what occurred uh, during World War II and the Army McCarthy hearings, uh, all the things that, that went bad. Um, some of you may or may not have known the story about Einstein. Um, he left Germany in 1932 uh, with his wife, and when things started coming down, they, I, he asked his wife to look back on the train and said, say goodbye, you'll never see it again. What he didn't know was that he was coming to get another oppressive government. And uh, at that time, he, well, it was a few years later, actually, 1939, when he sent Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, a letter saying, the Nazis are building an atomic bomb, we need to build one too, to protect ourselves from it, to be able to protect the world from Nazi Germany. Uh, Roosevelt called him a communist, and they actually uh, would not issue him a clearance to work on the Manhattan Project because uh, he was associated, he w because he knew this infra inside information about what the Nazis were working on, basically. Uh, it was years later when Oppenheimer uh, would be called a communist by the McCarthy uh, PAC, and uh, his clearance taken away. It's the father of the atomic bomb. His clearance was taken away. Uh, 25 scientists testified that he was not a threat, that in fact he, he actually uh, helped end World War II, and nothing was done. Uh, he was basically a, a downhill slide from there. He did nothing, and he died a very bitter man. Um, in, and that was in 1954 when, when that occurred. Um, Einstein said something that is very relevant uh, to this day. He said, I have never been a communist, but if I were, I would not be ashamed of it. The current investigations are, I can't read my own writing, an incomparability greater, oh, incomparably greater danger to our society than those few communists in our country ever could be. And I see what's going on currently uh, with this stage of uh, Ashcroft and Poindexter and all of the things they're putting in place to tap uh, your internet line, see what you're doing, to, to look at your keystrokes, to... They're actually putting in place a deal with the FCC so that your telecom companies have to agree to giving up the information with or without a warrant and to be able to place these uh, wiretaps on your lines and to be able to get the information, especially on cell phones. Uh, that's a whole new world for them that they're working with. Um, you know, and I don't want to make light of national security. Um, I knew Danny Lewin, I knew Danny Pearl. Um, I don't want to see 9-11 happen again. And I think national security is very important. But what I see in place right now is not national security. It's, it's terrorist activity from the government. Um, I have a pin on here um, from John Gilmore. We were having dinner, and he gave me this pin that says, uh, suspected terrorist. And I said, Jesus, John, <laughs> I already get checkered tickets every time I check into a, a plane. Um, he was uh, actually on a plane on Virgin Airlines, or Airways, whatever they're called, um, and he had this pin on, and he would not take it off. They asked him to take it. I guess he got on the plane first and put it on, and they asked him to take it off. Uh, they turned the plane around. They dropped him down. I mean, they landed first. And they, uh, <laughs> although, you know, don't put it beyond our government. Uh, be pushing people out of planes. Um, but uh, he, he has been looking for a lawsuit, a very substantial lawsuit, uh, to make some precedents. And I think this is going to be it. Uh, our Constitution guaranteed free ingress and egress uh, without being, having to give over your ID because he's already been fighting that fight for a while. So he had to wait for the next move. And, and so that's going to be... Uh, the next level of that whole fight. Now that program is called CAPS, 
C-A-P-P-S, in CAPS 2. Uh, what that does is when you check on to, when you get your ticket, uh, many of the airlines are connected into a database where they're checking your credit record, where you're checking, they're checking your marital status, where they're checking all of the things that could make you a terrorist, such as a bad credit rating or a divorce or the fact that you don't have children. Um, they're refusing to give up this information to the ACLU. They have several, uh, several cases already underway uh, about how the, the FAA is uh, making a, a mess of things. They're not saying what, what kind of things they're actually uh, doing with this information. They could be giving this information to someone, other agencies. They could be doing anything. And right now, they've actually redlined some people. You have a green, yellow, red uh, report card that is tied into your, your airline ticket. And people have been redlined because they're activists. And so those, those cases are currently being looked at. And they won't, you don't have any way to fight that because they don't have to say what's wrong with you to be on the red, red list either. So there are a few people out there who cannot get on a plane. Um, and I'm going to go back even further now for our history, whoa, history lesson here, <laughs> um, to the 1800s, where Leland Stanford uh, got in with three other entrepreneurs, and they borrowed money from investors, they borrowed money from uh, the government, government loans, and they built the Continental Railroad. That was our first infrastructure that allowed free egress and ingress, that allowed free trade. And as soon as Leland died, uh, they actually froze Stanford University's assets. And Mrs. Stan that's when Stanford University used to be a free school. And uh, yeah, can you believe that? Um, and so what they did was they froze the assets. She sold all of her private assets to keep the school open for three years. At the end of that three years, the government said, we're sorry we did that. I guess it was wrong of us and illegal, but here's your money back. We're taking over the railroad anyway. And a lot of companies went down over that. And so uh, that's, that was our first infrastructure that was taken over very easily by the U.S. government. And I expect with all of these laws in place that we're going to see another takeover uh, very soon. Um, there are good laws, like there are good laws that keep uh, spammers away, and I mean they're they're not in place yet. There could be some good laws, that good legislation. But along with this good legislation is the RIAA uh, going ahead and, and putting legislation like the DMCA in place, where where it's not worth a damn, and it's also you know putting people like Dmitry Skilarov in in prison, and so. Um, I was put in the middle of that uh, uh, last, well, when he was arrested, and learned that I, his wife was called at 3 a.m. Russia time. And the feds actually said to her, we have your husband. You better tell us everything we, we want to know about your husband. And we have him in jail. And what is that? You know, what the hell is that? Um, so the, our government is completely out of control at this time uh, as far as being able to just legislate whatever they want. It's time of war. And, you know, I don't want to have to tell my 14-year-old niece when she's in college and learning about the civil rights that she has lost, why I was not fighting for them, why her fellow students may have to die in the streets to get them back. And... People aren't aware of what's going on right now, and that's, it's up to you, you know. Uh, you guys have a lot of power out there. And the next line of products, I feel, is, is keeping the everyday Jane and Joe's privacy safe from the government, <laughs> from everyone, from commercial entities who are buying it from the government, from, from everyone. Uh, so you have... People will be willing to pay for privacy in the not-so-distant future. And I believe that that is where the next line of, of 
technology is going, especially when you have nanotechnology coming into place. Jesus. Uh, when I go over to NASA and, and Lawrence Livermore and see what they've got cooking, it's, it, it won't be long before we have the little nanobot mosquitoes. I actually saw this thing, and it's amazing. It has a little tiny camera on it, so it can actually go flying into your boardroom or hotel room or bedroom and whatever, see whatever. But, uh, you know, I was talking to a guy from Google, a sales guy the other day, and I said, I'm really concerned about Google, and I don't know what your continued position is, because when you go on a Google search, of course you know this, they can see what you're searching for. They can see everything about you. They're, uh, you know, in the daily course of what you search for, I mean, it's pretty much a profile unto itself. And that is a scary thing to give a company that much power I mean, it's become a verb, right? You're going to go Google something. And people Google it from their pockets. People Google from everywhere. And the government is now figuring out that they can go ahead and subpoena that stuff. I mean, these are not offshore servers. So it's a very bad, bad thing what's going on right now. And I just, I hope that you look more into these issues and that you take some power back whatever means necessary. Um, trying not to say a call to arms right now. I, I understand I could get arrested for that. <laughs> but uh, some very important things are going down in the future. You guys are the future. I mean, you're going to decide a big part of what goes on in the next 10 years of legislation and such. So anyhow, that's, uh, that's my talk. Thank you. So. Any questions? Hey, I'm going to get away with no questions? OK. Any more questions? Oh, we got one. I'm sorry, what is the best way to evangelize your ideas? Well, you know, <laughs> you guys have the power to write anything you want and any website you'd like. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I'm not advocating hacking. Um, I'm just saying that you could be creative in this way. Um, you can get your blog up and running. You can tell people. You can actually form groups and start something. Um, if, if anybody wants to work with me on this project, I'm very open. Um, I've got some, some little plans in place. Um, that you could be very helpful on. So, any other questions? No, no. All right. Well. So last year, uh, actually just about a year ago, some researchers at MIT figured out a way to use apps against itself. Figured out how terrorists itself could use apps to actually get a member of their own of their conference plan. What do you think about about using these laws and these these uh, new procedures? Yeah, the question is, uh, MIT, a group at MIT figured out how to use CAPS against itself. Now, you know, <laughs> our government's pretty lame about technology and legislating technology, and, and they are hiring a lot of hackers these days who are out of work uh, to help them put things together, but I also know a lot of those hackers are, are walking the double line and, and letting some information out about what's going on. Um, so. Uh, I, I do believe there's 50,000 different ways to turn that stuff around and, and use it against itself. And it, uh, it can be a very uh, tricky thing to do, but you guys are smart. You can do it. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, how, how to highlight the negative in the media. 
Um, I was speaking to a, a member of the FCC, uh, one of the people in charge of that, and I asked him, I said, why, are, why isn't the general public aware of what's going on with the new FCC laws? Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on out there currently that's going to change the way that we watch TV, by the way we uh, broadcast TV, by the way we listen and watch and people are watching us um, through the new legislation. And I, I asked him point blank, I said, is it because most of the media is still waiting to get their license? And a lot of those newspapers and a lot of those magazines are conglomerates. And it's true. Uh, people are afraid to say what's going on right now because somehow or another, I mean, you can still find it on the alternative press, but in mainstream press, you don't see a lot of criticism. And that's, that's one of the things that, um, that's one of the things that's going to have to change soon. But, but oh, okay, go ahead. Free press, that's an oxymoron. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, except for in very rare circumstances. It does not exist anymore. Uh, that's what the beauty of blogs. Um, I highly recommend that, uh, how many bloggers are here? Good, 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 good. Keep blogging, because that's where change is gonna come from. No, I don't have a gun. But I was going to suggest that maybe some of the motivation that goes on, you know, we need to have people think a little bit out of the box. Uh, postulating that the reason for all of this is the government has gotten terribly worried about people acquiring weapons of mass destruction. Now, I mean, the problem with people having weapons of mass destruction is, you know, if I acquire a weapon of mass destruction and my neighbors don't have one, then I can start threatening my neighbors and say, you will do what I want or I will use my weapon. You know, one of the alternative ways of thinking about it, since the way that the knowledge and technology seems to be going is that the knowledge of how to do this will become universal, is to say, let's try and fix it so everybody has weapons of mass destruction. In which case, you, you start thinking about things entirely differently and a lot of this restriction that comes about because you're trying to keep knowledge from seeping out into the world becomes irrelevant. You're going to say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, if, if you have your weapon of mass destruction, everybody else can threaten you and say, well, if you try using yours, we will use ours and you'll be toast. Yeah, uh, we are the weapon of mass destruction, aren't we? Um, yeah, I think impeachment's the answer to that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, you know, Len set the world free with the internet, Len and Larry. Um, we had a lot of barriers up uh, with communicating with the rest of the world and the rest of the world communicating with us. So, I don't know, there's no answer to this. Um, and, it, and my time is over. So I just want to thank Len for joining us today. Thank you very much, Len. And thank all of you for coming and sitting in, in this heat. Sorry about the air conditioning being off. Uh, thank you.